Good morning, Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you from the Dolph Simons Family Studio, and glad to be back with you on this beautiful but crisp Tuesday morning. Mm. Unfortunately, COVID is back with us today as well, and my partner in crime, Dana Hawkinson, yeah. got some numbers for us. Yeah, the cold did not make COVID go away. I know, darn it. The <laughs> we, heat didn't either. No, it didn't. The summer heat. So it really is a virus. It does stick around. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, our numbers are still pretty high. Um, 101, 101 acute infections in the hospital. 53 of those, so over 50% are in the ICU. And of those, 24 are on the ventilator. So still very, very high. That's a um, lot. We have 58 that are in that recovery period as well. So we still have quite a few total patients that are here that shouldn't otherwise So it was 103 and 58, right? Uh, 101 and 58, Okay, so yep. we're at one. So about 160. Yeah, right, so 159, 160, okay. Well, that's a big number, and, and unfortunately, we're seeing it continue to rise. Yep, and Hayes, Hayes. is at 24 actives okay. and eight um, in that recovery period, so 32 patients uh, taking up that capacity in their hospital. They bumped up a little bit too. A little bit. Yeah. And we have patients in Great Bend and Pawnee Valley yes. as well. So really it's it's everywhere, which is exactly where we don't want it to be. Mm -hmm. But as we've said before, SARS-CoV-2, it's everywhere you want to be. We have two people with us who have kind of really worked a lot on um, COVID-19 and, and rural health over the years. Bob Mosier is the Dean of the School of Medicine in Salina. He is also the former secretary of KDHE and, we are, and a family medicine physician. And we are delighted to have Bob joining us this morning, as well as David Wild, familiar to, you, to many of you who watch this program. Uh, David is our Vice President of Performance Improvement and has really helped, leading, uh, helped to lead our coronavirus mm -hmm. response team here mm -hmm. at KU. Before we get to them, or as we get questions from reporters, we may turn to them this morning. Let's see if there are questions from reporters. I'm not hearing it. We're good. Okay, Jill, that's up to you then. What, what, do you have questions from reporters? Uh, I do not have any questions from reporters at this time. All They're right. listening in. Excellent. Right. Well, let me first turn then to Bob Mosier, the Dean of the School of Medicine in Salina. Um, Bob, how is the viral uh, spread impacting learning in the community around you? How are things going in Salina? Well, we're like everybody else. We've seen a, a pretty significant increase in the numbers um, over this last month. Um, the good news is, is really uh, as far as uh, School District 305, you know, uh, keeping up with what's been going on in the community, a uh, low number of uh, cases you know, through the school activity. Um, and so they're still, you know, uh, with a uh, model that's fitting uh, the education needs for the students at the School of Medicine and School of Nursing here in Salina. We've been pretty fortunate. We've had a, a few students who've had COVID-19, but um, uh, identified early, isolated. We've had uh, really across all three campuses uh, at uh, KUMC We've not had any confirmed cases of student to student or student to faculty, faculty to student transmission. So, you know, the public health measures of the social distancing and the face mask use obviously work. Uh, so uh, the students are encouraged that they're able to get some hands-on instruction uh, with all the proper public health safety measures um, and uh, still participating quite actively in their educational process. Well, that, 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 that is really good. How is, the, how is COVID-19 doing? How's the hospital there in Salina doing? Yeah, they've seen a, a bump in their numbers as well. I, I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, they're, you know, pretty stressed uh, as far as uh, the impact on staffing goes. I think uh, the last couple of days, uh, they've been at 35, 34 capacity. Um, and that's significantly up from where it was a month ago, obviously. Um, but again, it's, it's uh, the impact of having staff who are out in the community and then have to be on quarantine if they've been exposed. Um, and, and that's really put a lot of pressure on many of our uh, rural health systems across the state as well. So you helped start the CARE Collaborative, which currently connects hospitals, physicians, and providers in 66 Kansas hospitals. What do you think the biggest challenge is for these small hospitals, especially some of the critical access hospitals? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, no, thanks for you know mentioning the CARE Collaborative, and currently led by the executive director, uh, Jody Schmidt, that I've been fortunate to work with uh, these last six years on that effort. Um, thank you guys, because uh, early on, we started ramping up uh, developing uh, COVID-19 triage and order sets 
um, and running those uh, through you guys, uh, Dana and, and Steve, and other uh, subject matter experts at KU have been a great help in helping us uh, support our, our rural health care uh, partners out across the state of Kansas. And uh, we partnered with KJ fairly early on in what was previously kind of a monthly case study of either EMI, stroke, or sepsis, and uh, made it a COVID update activity and, and had quite uh, active participation of uh, four to 500 folks uh, from across the many of our smaller hospitals engaged in that. Um, it has been a significant impact, obviously, as we have quite the mix in the number of communities that have the mask mandate and those that don't. Um, and we all know kind of that variation in the standard of care uh, creates a, a lot of variation in the outcomes, and we're, we're seeing that. Um, and it, it falls back again. They don't have a lot of backup staff. Uh, so when uh, they lose a, a, a head nurse or a two or three of their nurses or, or one of their providers, there's not a lot of people to step back in to fill that gap. And there's a lot of pressure on them. Uh, but as always, they're very innovative and um, deal with the pressure well and, and move forward. But I'm sure uh, their feelings of frustration uh, in some places, not getting maybe the community support that they need to deal with this pandemic. Yeah, that, that is a struggle. Is is mask mandating required in Saline County? It is. Um, Let me try been, that better. Is there a mask mandate in Saline County? Yeah, yeah. There, there is. Uh, you know, and, and um, initially, early on, it, uh, you know, there was a lot of variation as you go out into the community, but for the most part, I think folks have really adapted to this uh, new requirement and, and moving about, um, and, you know, with the mask mandate. So public health department here in, in Saline County has been uh, quite uh, proactive. And as a result, I think uh, that's helped. But um, they, they came out uh, with a new order on reducing group gatherings uh, to no larger than 15 uh, when we had this spike here at the beginning of uh, November. Um, and at this point, as you know from, and uh, Dr. Wild will probably talk about it as well, um, we're not sure what the impact of some of that uh, has been. Um, uh, just yet, we need a few more days to look at the data. So David, you've been looking at this data for the longest time. We're getting lots of questions as well about capacity and transfers from Greater Kansas. Talk to us about what's that, how's that going? Did you help run our transfer program? But also, what's the data telling you right now? Because I don't think I like what it says to me. I'm hoping it says something better to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, unfortunately, you're the one that likes to wear the rose-colored glasses, and I've got none. That's why I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. um, I think, in general, the data uh, tells us that we're in for at least a couple weeks more um, of challenges uh, with the uh, hospitalizations uh, at this point. And that's, of course, based on um, a small, uh, but hopefully significant decrease in the number of new cases in the community that we saw over the past four or five days. Um, that comes with one big caveat. Uh, the peak day was on the 26th of November, um, for as far as uh, new case reporting, uh, which um, yeah, you can see here, it's sort of when the solid red lines in Kansas, Missouri, really all of the states started to turn down. Um, but what we know is that uh, the 27th was really the start of the long weekend. And uh, we didn't have nearly as much testing and therefore nearly as much reporting over the weekend. So this could be a data phenomenon. I'm hoping not. Uh, I'm hoping that the 26th uh, remains our peak and that the number of new cases per day uh, stays on the decline over the rest of this week. And then, um, you know, that would mean that we're looking at the right side of this graph, this uh, sort of depiction of the number of the patients per million in the hospital, which um, is definitely telling the story of why we're feeling across the, the Midwest, why we're feeling so much crunch in capacity. Um, and we've, we've spoken a number of times about how the number of patients in the hospital today is really related to cases uh, new infections that happened 7, 10, 14, even 20 days ago. Um, and so we have a period of time of a couple of weeks, most likely after um, after the, the case peak on the 26th, before hospitalizations would start to slow. And that's um, assuming, uh, which I think is a concern, assuming, as Dr. Mosher mentioned, that the impact of Thanksgiving is not uh, another increase in new cases. And, and we're all worried about that. 
Yeah, I think that fish hook looks good, but I'm a little nervous about what it really means. I'm not sure how much of a testing phenomena it is because over the holiday weekend, we just didn't test as much and how much of a real phenomenon it is. We see our numbers continue to rise. As you point out, we're weeks mm -hmm. behind that though. So uh, the, the actual number of new infections in the city. So we'll have to follow that really closely, especially post Thanksgiving. And around the country, you're seeing more people get really active about it. I saw California thinks, feels, felt like they are the governor, governor there, Gavin, I was in a Gavin Newsom th said, yeah. gosh, we think we're days away from going back into a lockdown mm -hmm. mode. Thoughts about that, David? What, do you think Kansas or Missouri could be approaching that from a standpoint of the amount of infection and potential spread we're seeing? I think that there's the potential for um, a need for further intervention uh, for community risk mitigation. And whether that's a full lockdown or whether that's additional sort of restrictions on how we move and gather, and, um, especially in the places that we know by data um, are likely to be hotspots for transmission in places where we can't wear masks the whole time, where we gather um, in groups and don't keep six feet of physical distancing, even if it's groups of four or six, you know, bars, restaurants, gyms, um, sporting events. Not that those things in themselves are inherently bad, but they are areas where we gather. And we know based on cluster information that those sorts of activities lead to more transmission. And so we may have to consider, I say we, we, the collective community may have to consider other sorts of interventions like that. Um, you know, we talked a little bit here both about the testing decrease. Um, the, the number of tests per day over the weekend in the state of Kansas were thousands less than our normal average. Um, so I am certain that a portion of that decline is due to a decrease in testing. Um, and uh, conversations with local health officials yesterday simply said that they were slammed with people needing testing calls about symptoms. So I think it's likely that, that we'll see an increase above where we have been the past few days. I'm just hopeful that it's not significantly higher than maybe that peak on the 26th and we begin to see that downturn. Yeah, was and then if that is the case, we would need, of course, those other interventions. Yep. You know, I was driving in this morning and the line then for the drive through testing that we run was backed up. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, that's not good. It's usually not backed up that early, but it was backed up this morning. Yeah. Bob Mosier, is that your sense? Do you think, well, how would um, the county you're in and, and how would other counties around you, do you think, receive any sort of increased mandates as far as any restrictions? Yeah, that would you know, be tough. And I think, uh, you know, that's why promoting the use of the face masks at all times when out and about and the social distancing, all, all of those um, public health measures have been talked about uh, from the beginning are so critical. Um, you know, the, the larger the percent of the population that would uh, adhere to those, I, I think would uh, go a long ways to helping reduce the spread of this and keep us from having to, to face something like a, a lockdown again. I, I know that's been very hard on the more small businesses and not, not um, you know, welcome, uh, obviously, um, and yet, uh, you know, how do we approach that with a fair hand? Is, I think it's going to be something that uh, the community and, and all those involved in addressing the common good, as Dr. Wild talks about, that need to be involved in that. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a tough decision, but we do have to stop it because I think we've identified since the beginning of November that there is a, a, a capacity ceiling in uh, critical care and, and even basic hospitalization and uh, that COVID-19 is impacting that. That means other health conditions, chronic conditions that we deal with every day uh, may have to suffer because they don't have the capacity here for that. Uh, so it's getting to be critical and, and we need to have plans and ready to move on that. Uh, we can't wait too long. Okay, well, thank you. Well, Jill, let's see what questions we have out there. Um, yeah, and Dr. Bozier, I know that you can hear me. You have low bandwidth and we're having difficulty understanding you. I think I'm gonna ask you to call in on the line. Logan will, will deal with that while we ask some questions. Okay, Susan saw Dr. Hawkinson on KSHB this morning and you went over some of the signs and symptoms of COVID mm -hmm. and it included like a runny nose, which mm -hmm. is what she had when she went to work and they tested her, found out that she mm -hmm. had COVID. So her question now is hers were mild, lost her sense of smell mm -hmm. and taste. She just wants to know, if you had COVID like me, what are the vaccine requirements going to be? What do you think, Hawk? You know, I, I don't think we, we know that. Um, 
if you've had COVID-19, you are still going to be recommended to get the vaccine. And that's true for influenza. It's true for other things. Absolutely. Isn't it, right? I mean, we still recommend get the vaccine yeah. because we don't know how long your immunity is going to last. It could Correct. wane over a period of weeks and months, and you don't want it to wane. Yeah, especially like shingles. If you've had shingles, you absolutely need to get the vaccine to help prevent another recurrence. And I know that you don't want another recurrence of shingles. So yeah. certainly we know that even if you've had COVID-19, there will be a recommendation to get the vaccine. We just don't know exactly when that will be. Is it gonna be 10 days, 14 days, 21 days from the onset of symptoms? We, we don't really know that. I would, I would believe though, certainly if you've had more mild illness um, and had just a few days of, of, of symptoms, more than likely what we have seen is that um, when they do look at antibodies for whatever that is worth, you tend not to have as high peak antibodies as say somebody with critical illness, and maybe those antibodies don't last as long. Now again, that doesn't take into account the memory cells of the immune system, but you're still gonna have a recommendation to get the vaccine. We just don't exactly know when. So hopefully when those are um, EUA or approved, we'll have better guidance on that. Lindsay Shively with 41 News is asking, she said, she also saw you this morning. I, you were yeah, a popular man at 41 Actions. Yeah. What did you do? Did you she, dress up or something? What happened? Um, People remember you today. I know. I was, yeah, no, just <laughs> normal clothes. Yeah, she wants to know. She said no she, did, she did talk to it, but she wants to ask you again. People who gathered mm -hmm. with others outside their bubble on Thanksgiving, should they get tested even without a known exposure or symptoms? If so, we're five days after Thanksgiving yeah. today. Should they start getting tested right now? Would yep. you test everybody who gathers outside their bubble for you Thanksgiving? Know, that, my only concern is if we say that, well, people do that like all the time, not just on Thanksgiving. So that means we'd have to do it all right. the time. Right. We know that there are capacity issues, testing yeah. capacity issues. You know, that was a, it wasn't a recommendation by the CDPC, but certainly Dr. Burks had said it, and I don't know if Dr. Fauci had said it as well. Um, you know, they were recommending quarantine. So certainly, you know, and the question was, well, but again, if it's you not were with, unique to Thanksgiving. It's it's the, it's the question is your behavior, right? It's if you've gathered into a new group, should you go quarantine after that? And and the the most, um, you know, conservative view would say that's what you probably should. Do. Right, and and Thanksgiving took the spotlight because we know how much travel occurred and people traveling from large different areas around the nation to certain areas. Um, not a complete mass migration, if you will, but many, many people traveling. And so there was that, that soft recommendation or possibly it was said you know, by Dr. Burtz, you should think about getting tested, certainly quarantining. But if you are after an exposure and it, if it is um, you know, five to seven to eight, nine days after your exposure, that is when you are going to want to look to get tested. So, And I think underpinning those recommendations, not only is it good just infectious infection control science, but also where American hospitals are right now, right. because people are, we're, we're all really full. It's even hard to bring patients in from one area of the country to another. David, I think as you kind of help pilot that transfer center, I know there have been some pretty difficult stories about how hard it is to get sick folks into the right level of care. No doubt. Uh, and those stories come from all over uh, the, the country, really. Uh, you know, I've learned a lot about the geography of small town um, Oklahoma and Texas uh, and Nebraska over the last few weeks as the hospitals in those areas really have struggled with capacity. In fact, most times have no ability to accept a patient. Um, and so uh, yesterday, for example, uh, we had a call from a Texas hospital that actually was only maybe an hour, hour and a half from the Kansas border. So far northwestern uh, Texas, really close to the Oklahoma panhandle. Um, that hospital had called 25 hospitals already trying to find um, an ICU bed uh, for, for a patient that, that clearly needed an ICU bed. And so we have those sorts of stories. Um, and we, of course, try to balance that with um, the, the needs of people who are, are here um, in, in our communities or in our state. Um, just in the last week or so, we've had two transfers in from smaller towns <clears throat> in Kansas that have ended up needing ECMO, that extra corporeal mem uh, membrane oxygenation, that sort of uh, lung machine outside the body, if you will. Um, for people who cannot manage to, to oxygenate or provide their body with enough oxygen and ventilation uh, on a normal uh, mechanical ventilator. So two of those patients transferred in in the past uh, several days, and both of them are uh, in their 40s, um, and both of them were healthy prior uh, to this 
Um, and so we're, we're struggling. I mean, if you think about the capacity, even a hospital like ours has to do uh, that sort of intervention, we um, have a limited number of machines uh, to be able to do that. And so um, it, it doesn't take long before we're at our capacity for those sorts of things too. So we've struggled over the past day or two, um, really over the past week, week and a half, there was a little bit of a break right around uh, the Thanksgiving holiday uh, to, to manage our ICUs so that we have uh, a place for the patients who really have that critical need. And um, it, it has been a challenge. The transfer center calls can be harrowing when you talk uh, to these people who um, are doing everything within their capacity and capability in the hospital they're in. Um, and they really need help for their patients who who have an, an acute and critical need. So, and I think to kind of go back to that question, you know, based on uh, Dr. Wild's data and stories, and we understand the unmitigated uh, spread of the disease, especially here in the Midwest. So again, no formal recommendation, but it is certainly recommended, number one, that you didn't travel. But if you did, really take care to try and quarantine once you've been back now to your uh, to where your home is, in addition to monitoring for symptoms, whether that's um, twice daily symptom checkers, as we would have healthcare workers do with um, checking your fever, your temperature, but just knowing your body and knowing if you're having uh, different feelings of muscle aches or chills or anything of that nature. And then really, again, thinking about getting tested as well, but I wouldn't do it any, any time before today. So really that five to seven day mark. And again, why do we land on that? Um, it's nothing uh, hard or set in stone, but that is the time when most people, if they do have symptoms, will have symptoms. But unfortunately, we've seen up to 40% or more of people will not have symptoms and be asymptomatic, so. And I think, you, know, I, you just can't say, can you imagine being that transferring uh, facility having somebody young and sick that you want to get taken care of and having to make 20, 25 calls. I mean, I choke up at that. I've been on the other end of these calls as an ICU physician for years. 25 calls. You're afraid somebody's going to die right there because you can't mm -hmm. get them care. I mean, I, I just, I don't know what you do with that other than to say, wear your darn mask because we've got to do a better job of taking care of each other. John Paul says he wants to know if the criteria for admitting a patient in the hospital had change. He said his father, who was in his 70s, was told by his physician that if you contracted COVID, you'd automatically be admitted for three to four days for observation. Has this type of mindset perhaps increased the hospitalizations you're seeing? Well, wow, I don't know. First of all, that's not the advice yeah. we would ever give no. anybody. We mm -hmm. would tell you, if, you, if, you're, if you're not needing oxygen or yeah. hospital-based therapies, there's no need for you to be in the hospital. In yeah. fact, that's a greater risk to you, so don't come in the hospital. Absolutely. I don't mean that from an infection control standpoint. I just mean, you know, you lay in bed, you don't get yeah. up, you don't move around. Yeah. You know, you do more things for yourself when you're at home. Mm -hmm. And so we know people do better at home. And guys, I, I'll look at David and Dana. Yeah. I don't, there's no way we would have ever said to that person to come in the hospital. No, I, I would agree. I mean, there are indications for hospitalization. Just having the diagnosis of COVID-19 is not, not an indication of no. because of those things that you've talked about, risks, you know, laying in bed, you're at risk of, of blood clots and just you're not in your normal uh, state. You're not in your normal home, but there are definitely indications. And if you meet those indications um, for hospitalization, you will be admitted. But if you don't, the emergency department wants to discharge you home because they know it's a safer place yeah. overall. If you don't need hospital intensive therapy. Right. So David, talk to us, what about some of the therapies we would offer to a patient that's in the hospital that would say, you need to be in the hospital, not at home? Yeah, I think you're right, Steve. I mean, unless you need specific therapies that are based in the inpatient setting, oxygen, um, maybe IV fluids for some people, specific um, uh, injectables or therapies that we might use like remdesivir, for example. Um, you, you don't need to be in the hospital. And I can say with certainty that the calls we're getting from across the Midwest, there are not people in the hospital just because they have COVID. Those are not the patients that are taking up beds. I mean, people are being discharged home on oxygen when they weren't on oxygen before to help recuperate across the state, uh, across the region. So I'm, I'm not at all concerned that we have people in beds simply because they were diagnosed with COVID and are, are being admitted here or really anywhere else being admitted for observation and that being part of our challenge for capacity. Bob Mosier, I take it that's the same story out in rural Kansas counties as well. Yeah, it absolutely is. Uh, you know, early on, uh, there were some uh, thoughts that as fast as a COVID-19 patient can decompensate and require, you know, intubation, um, some encouragement to the smaller facilities on confirmed COVID cases, um, 
you know, to consider early transfer. But obviously, as capacity's uh, gone to this point, we know um, many of our small hospitals have, um, if not all, have really stepped up to, to manage uh, more acute care level patients than what they might normally hold on to uh, just because of the challenges with uh, the transfer. But that was partly, uh, you know, what we worked with the uh, subject matter experts on creating the triage protocol was identifying those um, who need more than just, you know, uh, uh, O2 um, at, you know, any time they needed more than five liters uh, per minute. Um, it was probably time to be looking at uh, moving them on to a higher level of care. So they've, they've stepped up uh, as expected uh, to try to manage those patients they can within their facilities. Uh, but when it does take uh, time to move them on, it, it has been a challenge. And we saw that uh, back around the 6th of November when we got calls from uh, our partners with the Care Collaborative uh, spending, you know, three or four hours, sometimes eight hours, uh, just trying to find a transfer. And so we were able to work with our uh, preferred provider, LifeSave, and, and the software program they have, uh, Cheyenne Mountain Mission Control, uh, and they started calling hospitals to identify who had capacity so that that would uh, shorten this uh, need for the smaller hospitals to spend so much time on the phone uh, when they could be devoting that to patient care. Yeah, that's exact. Thank you. I think that was well said. Jennifer, Rebecca, and Stephanie all have questions about ECMO machines now. Okay, what is How an many ECMO? do we have? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and just can you come off of them? Yeah, you can't come off of them. David, you want to try and describe how ECMO works a little bit in, 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 in kind of good lay terms? And do we have enough? Yeah, do we have enough to? We only, it, I'll ask for that. No, we don't ever have enough ECMO machines. If you ask our, our surgeons about that, they always right. want more. But in this crisis, I, I think we've actually approved trying to get a few more ECMO machines as, uh, as well. But let, let's take a swing at that, David. Yeah, well, so I would guess I'll start with the question of do we have enough? Um, and I would agree. I think we always would say, boy, if, um, if they grew on trees, we would like more. Uh, you know, an ECMO program is important for heart failure, for heart transplant, and also for very severe uh, lung damage, uh, adult respiratory distress, distress syndrome, or ARDS, if you've heard of that. Uh, and that's really the need in COVID patients. It's because their lungs are so damaged they cannot function to provide enough oxygenation or ventilation for the patient. Um, so uh, patients do come off of ECMO, depending on the reason that they were uh, placed on ECMO. Um, COVID patients, not a lot have survived. Uh, and so we're relatively selective about who we put on. I mentioned both of the patients that we have on ECMO right now are in their 40s um, with no other medical problems. So they have maybe um, a better chance, uh, given that they were healthy before, of surviving. Uh, so it's not it's not that you don't come off ECMO. Um, as far as the actual number, um, it's a little challenging. We can piece together parts of, say, the bypass machine, and that gets really complicated. But um, the bypass machine used, the heart-lung machine used for bypass surgery, for example, for heart surgery. We can piece together um, a couple parts of that to make another maybe one or two ECMO machines. But then that means that we don't have the ability to do emergent heart surgeries because those machines are being used. So the number could vary somewhere here between maybe four and six or seven. Um, at any one time, depending on how aggressive we were with piecing things together. Um, and it has to be the right for the patient, the right uh, exact right configuration, because uh, what the machine does is take blood out of the body, run it through um, an oxygenator to put oxygen back in, and then resupply it so the heart can pump it around. Um, and so that's a surgery that's required. It's a trip to the operating room. Lot, lots of, of things there that have to be uh, coordinated and really be just right for the patient for it to make a, a benefit. I think the key is what happens is the, the virus causes such damage to the lung, you gotta rest somebody's lung. And if you're constantly using a ventilator to push air into the lungs, you're using what's called positive pressure. So you push air in. Normally when we breathe, we pull air in. And so the lungs, that, it, it works because we expand our lungs. It creates a bit of a negative pressure and air moves into our lung. When you use a ventilator, you're pushing air in. That positive pressure can actually damage the cells that line the airway, which are also sometimes the cells that COVID uh, is or SARS-CoV-2 is damaging. So ECMO rests the lungs. So you don't have to do quite as many breaths or have quite as much pressure because you're putting this blood through this machine to help oxygenate and sometimes pull off carbon dioxide. And when you do that, you can rest the lung. 
The only hospitals in Kansas City that I'm aware of, and David, you may know, are both KU and St. Luke's, so mm -hmm. the, only, the main campus St. Luke's can do ECMO. I, don't, I think we're the only two locations in the city that do that. And I think the, the key is there are limited machines, because normally we don't have that much demand. We sometimes have had to do with influenza, too. That's the other big viral illness, or RSV, that we may get struck and have to use this. But we're doing a lot more of it now. So it just comes back to the, the thing you've been hearing. You heard from Bob Mosier about those small town hospitals trying to step up. You heard from David about difficulty getting uh, people transferred. You're hearing from us the limitations and resources. The thing you really need to hear is what you need to do in order to help prevent this crisis. Mm -hmm. Because the crisis is in fact upon us. So how do you do to, how can we, what can we do to really bend that curve, especially as we are in this period, this holiday period between Thanksgiving and Christmas? Lori says it's her birthday and she watches you all the time and she wants me to pick her questions. So okay, this is happy for birthday, you, Lori. Lori. Oh, happy yeah, birthday. Yeah, thank you for watching. She wants to know about vitamin D deficiency related um, stories that it's helpful with COVID. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? You bet. Well, so vitamin D deficiency, mm -hmm. I know we've looked at that and yeah. I think any time you may have a deficiency in a vitamin, you set yourself up, Dana, to have different kinds of illnesses. Yeah. It's not necessarily just COVID. You can have a problem with your bones, you can have trouble with heart disease, you can have trouble with all sorts of things. So having the right level of different vitamins is essential. Yeah. Um, I don't know that it's specifically uh, directed at COVID, though. I think that's true for almost any disease. That, that's absolutely correct. Right now, uh, with the current state of knowledge, there is no uh, good randomized trials. Uh, there's not a lot of good literature out there showing that, number one, it prevents you from getting COVID-19 infection. I'm talking about vitamin D supplementation that you can get over the counter, that it prevents getting infection, nor does it prevent severe uh, disease nor um, change in outcomes such as mortality. So I think it's healthy for people to supplement uh, as directed by their physicians because certainly in the northern hemisphere here, a lot of people are vitamin D deficient. But right now in terms of COVID, um, there is, there's no good uh, real data to suggest that there is any help in prevention of getting infected nor prevention of severe disease and mortality. But certainly there are trials going on right now with those as well. Isaac wants to know if rural areas are going to get a shot at the vaccine. Will any go to their ah, hospitals? Great question. Mm -hmm. Well, we do know that it is, uh, and, and I think we'll have to stay tuned mm -hmm. for how this plays out today. Um, just as a, as a message, and we'll talk a little bit at the end of the program, you can tune in to the CDC panel advisory panel today about how the virus is going to get distributed. It's, a public, uh, it's available uh, on public uh, media, um, and, and you can watch it live. It's interesting. I think what is happening is that CDC will be allocating it to states with guidelines, and then the states will have final say in who's going to get it. I do believe that it's going to end up going to essential health care workers, essential being defined as you're actually involved in the direct patient care of people who have COVID-19. Um, I think that's true. It'll be distributed throughout the state based on some number um, mm -hmm. of, 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 of um, a ratio of how many patients with COVID you have and how many health care workers you have. And that'll be the first wave of the vaccine along with nursing home patients and people who work in nursing homes. After that, it starts getting distributed to other essential workers, including the rest of hospital workers and teachers and um, uh, grocery store workers and food processing workers and people who help keep all of us alive. And so then it starts getting to more uh, general public. Any other thoughts around that, David? I know you've been on some calls with KDHE as well. Or is Bob Mosier? Um, that, that pretty much sums it up. The advisory panel today will uh, continue to meet about um, the, the recommendations, as you mentioned. and. Um, it, it does sound like as far as the general public um, plan, they will meet a number of times after today. I think this is maybe their 25th or 26th meeting. Um, and so they'll continue to review data and try to make that plan, but uh, we'll know more soon. Bob, uh, thoughts or things that you're hearing out in rural Kansas? No, I, I agree with what you guys have said. It makes it a little easier for them to uh, ramp up the distribution model uh, as they know exactly what the number of vaccines will be that, that will become available. Um, but, but you're right, the, the different phases they're looking at, uh, uh, population density, all of that I think will play an important role. It, it is a little bit challenging. I was uh, obviously in practice during uh, H1N1 and it was interesting, the distribution was kind of based on population density in little old Greeley County, we got three vaccines. Um, so it's kind of tough. Well, who are the three people to get the vaccine? Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm pleased to see that the number of vaccines that are available are really ramping up quite quickly, but 
Uh, I think the protocols that they've developed have been well thought out, kind of based on the pandemic influenza model. Uh, we didn't quite anticipate necessarily the coronavirus uh, being the one that we'd be ramping this out across again, but um, it, it should be available to the general public, uh, you know, by uh, July, it, it looks like, uh, based on a what they say, but as Dr. Wild mentioned, we'll know more after uh, today's meeting and uh, subsequent meetings that follow. I'm seeing some things coming out of both CDC and HHS and some predictions saying that we may have enough vaccine even in through May to have gotten everybody vaccinated. Have you seen that? Yeah, I think that's important to note. This first batch of initial vaccines, number one, just by at least one company, that's why we need more companies uh, because we know that through Operation Warp Speed, there has been a buildup of supply from those other companies as well if they do get approved. So this first batch is going to be a range, but it will be a small range. Um, we are also working with Wyandotte County to get the vaccine to our most vulnerable populations as well. We've had some meetings and we have another meeting with Wyandotte County here um, today. So that will be important. So this initial batch, you know, say from mid-December to January 1 is probably going to be very small. It will be allocated through the state to um, the different regions of, of, of the state. Uh, but certainly after that, just like you said, I think the supply is gonna be much greater, especially when you're moving in to later January, uh, February, and then the early spring, there will be much better supply. Uh, Becky had a good question. She wanted to know, follow up again on the ECMO, the two men that were considered young mm -hmm. and healthy, mm -hmm. Would someone who is not young and healthy be also allowed to be put on an ECMO machine? Yeah, you bet. There's so many things that it mm -hmm. depends on with ECMO. Um, lots of other, you look at how many comorbid conditions, how many other kind of heart and lung problems you have. But age is not really a restriction for ECMO. It's just whether or not, we, for a lot of other variety of reasons, that we think you are a candidate for it. Can you handle ECMO? Can your body handle ECMO? Because you have to have a reasonable heart-lung system at baseline to handle ECMO. Otherwise, it, 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 the, the machine itself will probably be detrimental to you. And Sean's asking questions that have to do with transfer um, and wondering, are we doing anything with our patients to be freeing up space, transferring between facilities? Um, and has there been any progress in transferring patients that are no longer in the acute phase? Oh, that's an interesting question. So are we able to transfer patients out? You know, one of our big <clears throat> struggles, and David, you can comment on this, has been that with nursing homes plagued by COVID-19, it's been harder to get people from the hospital into nursing homes or rehab because they have been locked down due to COVID-19. So how are we doing with that crisis? And have we actually discharged people to lower levels of care who have, uh, are post-COVID? Yeah, so post-COVID is a little bit harder. Um, there are uh, facilities that um, will take if the, the need is post-acute care, so uh, long-term care, nursing home level of care, not acute hospitalization. Um, there are facilities that will take COVID positive patients, but um, they have to have uh, the ability to do that. Uh, so to, to sort of cohort those patients, ideally in a different wing, or at least in a different set of rooms and manage the staff coming in. Um, and so that's been hard for some places and, and it has caused us problems at, at times. Uh, the bigger problem has actually been transferring out um, non-COVID patients who need those level of that level of care, those sorts of things. Because um, when a facility does have um, a couple of cases, they close to all admissions, not just COVID admissions, but all admissions for a number of days. And so that has caused us a little bit of a backup at times. As far as transferring acute patients out to other uh, hospitals, um, that is a challenging for a lot of reasons, um, not the least of which is matching up sort of the right patient with the right location. Um, and then we have to remember that those patients require transport back to a hospital that may be closer to them that that um, uh, that can provide services uh, and meet their needs. And that transport almost always requires an ambulance. And our EMS services are taxed as it is transferring really acute ill patients to hospitals. And so asking them to do a two or a three or a four hour transport run, maybe um, two or three or four hours in each direction um, is as much of a challenge as finding the right place. And so we've not been really successful at that yet. Um, we're working, uh, Dr. Moser mentioned um, conversations with, uh, with KDHE. We're working at the state level to help identify ways to make that easier. Um, it's definitely part of our plan. There's not been a lot of it uh, to date. Um, so there, there is an impact from that, I'm sure. But everybody's full. And so even if I want to send it to another hospital, they've got to have a bed as well. So, Bob, thoughts about that and the stress that are going on in rural health systems. How are they faring with this? 
Yeah, they're they're faring well. Obviously, uh, the staffing uh, remains uh, an issue, and this is always the time of year when uh, hospital volumes increase across uh, rural Kansas, uh, typical of uh, an older population base and chronic conditions. But um, in the critical access hospitals, they have what's called a swing bed program, which is kind of a post-acute care, uh, skilled nursing uh, level of care for uh, patients. So uh, we've been reciprocating as far as, you know, seeking out um, larger facilities that are able to take these patients in, COVID-19 patients for uh, the acute care ICU level, and then also working back with many of our rural partners on uh, being ready to take patients back into their swing bed or recovery uh, phase type care. Uh, and, and many of them have stepped up and said, you know, absolutely, if we've got somebody that needs to come back and it's not our patient, but it's from uh, our region, we'd be more than happy to, to work with uh, any of the larger hospital systems to move patients out to make room for those acute care that we need to move on up to your level. So uh, we're early in that process and, and working and, and like the larger facilities, everyone's always worried about, you know, what's this wave look like? Is it peaking? Is it dropping? Or is it only going to get worse? And, and if they fill up, um, what do they do about the new ones that come in? So um, a lot of work to be uh, done in the background, but uh, everyone's certainly putting uh, their shoulder to the wheel and pushing hard. Well, I want to thank all of our guests this morning. It's been a great conversation. Thanks for being a part of it, David, for your insight here and ongoing hard work, Dr. Mosier out there in Salina, Kansas, and really throughout our care collaborative and with the School of Medicine. So thank you so much for all that you've done. Hey, tomorrow we have Dr. Heather Harris, who's the medical director at our Hayes Med Campus and chief medical officer there, and Kevin Myers, our infection prevention director there. They're going to join our call and take a deeper dive into what's going on with Ellis County. Hawkeye, final thoughts that you want to offer today? Yeah, you know, um, just reading through uh, CNN last night, they have a very good article about what happened early on in the pandemic in China. Mm -hmm. And today, December 1st, actually marks the first day that somebody uh, was known to be symptomatic in the city of Wuhan, uh, based on a Lancet article. So hopefully, uh, December 1st, 2021 is going to look much more like December 1st, 2019, 2019 in the United States as compared to December 1st, 2020 here. Um, we still have a long way to go, but I think there is optimism with the vaccines. We will hear more information about those in the next coming weeks, uh, but everybody has to continue to stay vigilant. Uh, really reduce those meetings and those gatherings of people who are not in your household. Continue to mask, continue to distance, and everybody be safe so that we can be here a year from now in December 1st, 2021. So true. Thank you. Hey, and also for those who want to hear firsthand the details of who will get the COVID-19 vaccine first, there is a public meeting. We mentioned that earlier in the program. It has 15 experts who have their own, um, uh, who've had been having several meetings on the topic. One of them is our own Dr. Kevin Alt, um, who is a infectious disease OBGYN physician here at KU. He is a member of the advisory committee on immunization practices, and he will uh, be attending that meeting today. Go to the CDC website for the link. The meeting is from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock p.m. And remember that next week's all about vaccination. We have a number of experts lined up, including I hope Dr. Alt will be on mm -hmm. to talk with us about our next step. You know, I was thinking on my way in today, how do, how do, you, how do we talk every day about the, the rules of infection prevention control and mentioning that they travel with you wherever you go? And I thought of something a little, uh, just a little different. You know, um, during this time before the vaccine and where therapy is changing, and, and, um, uh, but there's real hope there. How do we get through the darkest days as they grow short, shorter and colder? And I think the answer is, I'm not trying to be crazy here, but D&D, &D, dedication and devotion. Dedication to trying to help each other out and devotion mm -hmm. because we do it out of love. We do it out of duty and we do it out of love. Dedication and devotion can help us bend that curve. That's what we need all of you to do, because we are grappling with a viral terrorists. I believe that SARS-CoV-2 is very much like a terrorist. It's going to strike even if when you don't want it to, even if you think you're trying to be careful, and it can destroy your life if you're not careful. But you can beat it, and you beat it with dedication and devotion to the rules of infection control, which can keep you and your family safe. Don't get beat by a viral terrorist. Pounce back and do it with dedication and devotion. We got a story here about COVID-19, the viral terrorist.
every three days, we have the same number of deaths from COVID-19 as we did from all the terrorist attacks on 9-11. And I think about that, I think about what happened on 9-11, and when you left after that day, and you started seeing on roofs and in flags and signs everywhere, united we stand. We have this shared humanity where we're all in things together, but for some reason we want to fight simple logic and truth. And it's odd to me because it's a fool's wisdom that takes us on a journey that says masks don't work when there is so much evidence that proves that they do.